All right, today we are talking about uh, women in the North during Reconstruction and what they were doing as we looked at what was going on in the South before, and then um, the transition to the Gilded Age and some of the early aspects of the Gilded Age. So the um, first thing with women um, was, of course, the disappointment of the 14th and 15th Amendment, because one of the things that women had been um, pushing for uh, before the Civil War and then during the Civil War, right, is that you during the abolition movement and during the Civil War, right, of course, that was the end of slavery push, but the all other thing that was tied with this was and women's rights, right, and while there was some pushback for this um, and then, and there definitely was some pushback where people said, Hey, this should be solely focused on freeing, uh, slaves, not women's rights. Um, there was still quite a bit of support, um, and, and from women and from men. Um, again, there were, there were men that pushed back and can, and then do afterwards as well. Frederick Douglass is probably, uh, the more ho high profile individual who pushed back on, um, uh, when pushing for women's rights from which, uh, the response was Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, like, you do realize that 50% of the black population are women. So this isn't just us. This is all women. Um, nonetheless, some felt that by adding women's rights to it, they were hijacking the abolition movement. Um, However, because of the uh, amount of work that women were also doing in the abolition movement and the fact that it was easy to tie those two together in terms of the ideas of we're pushing for freedom for one group of people, but wait, we're also not free in a different way, we should be included in this. They had more support. After the war was over, though, um, many had hoped with the necessary laws and, and amendments that were going to be put in place to in slavery that there would be something for women's rights in that as well which makes sense because the reality is it's, it's would have been the easiest time to get that legislative change right they're already making legislative change for the end of slavery and those rights so adding women's rights into that made sense it's harder to do when there's nothing else propelling that change um, however the 14th and 15th amendments did not make um, any specific concession for women and women's right to vote, which they had hoped. And in fact, uh, specifically in, in one part said that it was just uh, male for men uh, and left out women altogether. So not only did you have um, women not specifically put into the amendments and the right to vote, and especially with the 15th Amendment that made it clear that you couldn't discriminate based on uh, race, color, and previous servitude, again, the hope was that and gender would also be placed in that, and it was not. Um, and, and so this did leave people, so let's say there's only addressed um, men and what was the race, color, and previous servitude. Right, and so the the disappointment in that left some some people did give up. There was definitely a, a kind of like all the momentum for what the women's rights movement that had been taking place um, somewhat dissipated after um, these events. It did not go away, and there are still plenty of, of people who were pushing and felt uh, that they needed to just even push harder to to get recognized. Some of those main leaders, and this is not at all inclusive of everyone, just uh, uh, some that pop up a lot in, in things that they did and continued to push for were Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony. Um, all, all three of these women were uh, highly involved um, in the women's rights movement before the Civil War and after. Um, and so there, 
there were changes that took place after the Civil War. I, I mentioned one of them, which was, of course, that there was a decline in support for uh, the women's uh, right movement, and and so they lost, and and they actually, and they lost some big supporters, and and it was very disheartening for some of the women who um, felt like they had kind of been abandoned. Uh, in this process, right? We we fought, you supported us, we pushed for the end of slavery, we were successful, and now that that has taken place, you are abandoning the, you know, remaining aspect of the cause, which is to also get women these rights. Um, this also, some of the changes that took place was, was also, um, we'll say more divide uh, amongst women, I, there was already divide, all right? So not women weren't like this monolithic group that all agreed on, on the same issues. And, and so th then that existed before, um, where there were definitely, uh, we saw that with the Seneca Falls convention, which was kind of the first trying to outline what did the women's rights movement mean? Like what were the components of that? And, um, one of the big sticking points was voting. Um, because uh, what uh, really goes with this is the idea that, um, right, that you have a, a public sphere and a private sphere, right? And the private sphere is the domestic realm, which is where women are supposed to be. The public sphere, that's like we're voting, right? And no women. And this was a hard thing to like this viewpoint to overcome for many people and, and even women themselves, some women themselves said, well, we don't belong in that sphere, right? Well, we want to make sure that we're better protected. We have certain protections and rights. Voting is this, go, you know, political sphere where women don't belong. Um, and women are supposed to be in the domestic sphere. It's also the general, you know, there were kind of around society, people did tend to believe this, this idea of public versus private sphere. Um, and so it was somewhat of a sticking point. What, what ultimately happens is you get kind of two main women's groups that, that are, end up being created, the AWSA and the NWSA. The AWSA was the American Women's Suffrage Association. This group was the more moderate group, right? So they um, stopped pressing everyone so hard about uh, uh, the rights. They didn't give up, but, but they weren't as uh, in your face. They weren't um, uh, as forceful with promoting women's rights as they had been with uh, during the abolition movement and civil war. They also were uh, not as supportive of voting rights, whereas the NWSA was seen at the time as the more radical group, right? And that Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth K. Stanton, Lucy Stone, those, they, they were part of, of this group. Um, and they wanted full equality for women, which included voting rights. And this is the group that's going to continue to push to find a, a loophole. I guess I, I think it kind of comes about, but they, they, they were like, we're the ones that we're not going to be giving up. <laughs> we're not going to be uh, stopping. And we need to find a way to see if we can make this work for us because there was, a, again, you know, uh, understandably people were um, kind of defeated by the lack of um, acknowledgement for women and their rights at the end of the Civil War. Um, but, but the um, NWSA and the women that were a part of that just kind of bore down and said, nope, we're going to keep going. In fact, we're going to push harder and let's see if we can figure out a way to make this work. So one of the things that they end up doing is kind of creating a new interpretation of the 14th and 15th Amendment. Uh, kind, kind, of, kind of the idea of, okay, it's going to be way harder to get a, sixth, a, a 16th Amendment, right? The, I mean, eventually, the, well, I'm not talking about the actual 16th Amendment. It's going to be way harder to get a 16th Amendment in here that says now women also have the right to vote. 
Um, so again, the 16th Amendment is not that. That's just my, my saying, the, the idea of like, well, crap, they just did these two amendments. Uh, and technically the three, if you count the 13th with the end of slavery. So like, what's the likelihood we get the next one is going to be for us, right? And so if, we, if that's not the likely direction of this, um, then how can we use the 14th and 15th Amendment, which deal with voting rights, right? Because these are both connected to the voting rights and citizenship. Okay, so if, if, if these are connected to voting rights and citizenship, how can we use this to work for us? And so what you got was essentially a new interpret, not a new interpretation, an interpretation of how you can wordsmith the, the amendments to uh, try to make it so that women had a right to vote, right? And, and this is very much tied to, we're not gonna probably get them to, to make another amendment right now. So how can we make this one work for us? So in the amendment, it talks about persons and of having the right to vote, right, and citizens. Um, and actually, it, has, it talks about the rights, not persons, it talks about citizens having the right to vote in the 14th Amendment, that you have the right to vote, and then the 15th Amendment talks about you can't deny based on race, color, and previous condition of servitude. And so they say, well, women are persons, okay? And if women are persons, then they are citizens, right? And if they're citizens, then under the 14th Amendment, right? Uh, as per what it says, they have the right to vote. And, and as it is inherent and central to national citizenship, the right to vote, that they're saying this part here, therefore women's right to vote is already established in the amendment, in the 14th Amendment. Um, and, and so even though it doesn't specifically say women, you know, uh, if you take this interpretation to say, well, it does say citizens, and since women are persons and therefore, and born in, if these persons are born in the United States, they are therefore citizens, then they should also uh, be based on what is already written, have the right to vote as a right. And so this is going to be key, an inherent and central right of citizenship. Right, because what they're saying with this, it is a right as a citizen to vote. Okay, and the, we'll see the Supreme Court's going to come back and say no, it's not. Um, but that's what they're trying to push. And this was the, so this is called the New Departure um, with the title here, the New Departure. Um, and it was an attempt to work around what... Uh, was already in place to hopefully get women to be able to vote. They, this had been discussed and what they wanted to do with this. Um, and you did have a uh, Victoria Woodhull, um, who, who is, was quite a character. She ends up bringing it before the judiciary committee, uh, which some, uh, women felt was too early. Um, they, they didn't think that she, that, that they were ready to bring it up yet. She brings it before them to present the new departure idea. Um, and it gets rejected. So, so the, this kind of first attempt to, to bring it up gets rejected. She, she though, so it, it, it's going to show the backlash and it isn't just because of this. She's actually the first woman to, uh, put in a bid to run for president. Um, it doesn't last, but still it's, you know, the audacity of, of going for it at, at this point in time in the 1870s is impressive. Um, and she had some, you know, there was, there was initially a lot of support for her, but as she then started to make the push with the new departure and then with, as a, as a, a first, you know, female a president, uh, nominee to try for that. Um, she didn't get it chosen, but, but trying to push for that and, and to, to, to get elected, she obviously got people that were unhappy with a woman stepping so far into politics. Um, and she, she also had, was, um, 
there were rumors about her with with men and her relationships and marriages and she wasn't on just one marriage and ultimately what happens is at one point um, she gets threatened with the Comstock Act. The Comstock Act was an anti-obscenity uh, law. Um, and it, it actually wasn't um, just for women. However, not surprised. So it basically was that you could be charged um, under the Comstock Act for... Um, obscenities and, and whether that's language, uh, dress, behavior. It was technically, again, it didn't specify just women, it was for everyone, but the majority of people who were threatened and or charged with this law, this act, were women. And especially during this period in time, like your reputation as a, for, as a woman was extremely important. So if you get charged with the, the, the anti-obscenity or decency law, um, that's going to have a massive negative impact on yours. She actually gets arrested f uh, in connection to this after they had uh, threatened it. And um, unfortunately for her, um, a lot of the women kind of stop supporting her. Um, because they didn't want to they get that attached to their name as well. She ends up eventually getting uh, bailed out uh, in jail. I know Elizabeth Key Stanton, Susan B. Anthony um, did uh, uh, continue to support her during that time when a lot of people abandoned her, um, you know, saying that that was wrong to just uh, ditch her essentially but it's also understandable with with how important your reputation was like she she comes out of this after this like completely all any kind of momentum she had uh, any kind of support she had uh, pretty much dissipated um, and she eventually actually uh, marries a, a wealthy man from England and moves to England to uh, get away from the abuse and attacks to her character because of this event. So it, it, it was crazy. And, and again, while this, this didn't all take place just because of the new departure, it, it does show the peril that women could be in for continuing to press aggressively for their rights. Um, and, and we'll certainly, it's, this is going to pop back up with Susan B. Anthony when she is, is able to successfully argue the new departure and get registered to vote and be able to vote for a minute. It won't last, but, but that, but it does show, like I said that, uh, and I think it also, you know, reminded women that, yeah, this is still something that can utterly destroy your life. There's people out there that can, can and will destroy your life simply because you're, Ag aggressively pushing for women's rights and the right to vote as a woman. Um, and so after this event, um, they, they decided um, not to initially take it to like Congress, like uh, Victoria Woodhull had done, or like uh, a later Minor v. Happerset, which we'll put here, which are, where it's going to go to court in the Supreme Court. Um, and instead tried a different tactic. So in the 1871 and 1872 elections, they decided to go to local polling locations. And you could register to vote at the polling stations. And uh, like on, on the day of, of voting. And, and I know that, I think they just reenacted like that ability um, in some places, in a lot of places you can't do that, right? You have to register to vote uh, a, a certain number of days in advance from voting. But I know that there's a couple locations that actually open it back up to people being able to register at um, polling places on the, on the day of, of, of the elections. So, but that was a very common thing back then. And so really what they had to do is they, the, the, basically what they had to do is they had to convince the local polling people to let them vote and the way that they were going to do that was of course with the new departure argument right so they were going to present there was a group of women that were going to present um 
uh, and this is uh, Susan B. and Pity here. So there was a group of women that they were going to present to um, the polls, and and they were and they were in different areas, and um, they were going to try to they were all going to try to convince to first first goal was to register to vote, right? Not vote, but be able to register because they thought they might be able to convince people, some people to say, well, there's no harm in letting them register to vote. We're not going to let them actually vote. But we'll let them register to vote. And then, of course, goal two was to actually vote. Um, Mary Ann Shed Katie was able to register to vote, but not vote. So she was actually one of the first that was successful to use the argument to to be told that, okay, fine, you can register to vote, but you ain't voting, right? That kind of thing. Susan B. Anthony was able to convince them that not only should she be able to register, but she should be able to vote. And she did vote. And she came out and, and you know, uh, after she voted and, and excitedly proclaimed, we did it, I voted. Then there were a couple other women in different polling locations that also were able to convince to be able to register to vote. However, two weeks later, she was arrested. And she was arrested under a... Uh, uh, a law for Confederate soldiers. So again, this is where the, the previous thing with the Comstock Act showed and highlighted um, the potential um, dangers towards women who push this. Because Susan B. Anthony was able to actually convince them to let her vote, she then gets charged and arrested and put in jail, uh, uh, supposedly under uh, uh, the, the law saying uh, former high-ranking Confederate soldiers could not vote, right? During Reconstruction, that was definitely a thing. They had to get presidential pardons in order to be able to gain back their citizenship. So clearly, she was never a Confederate soldier or a high-ranking Confederate soldier. Just like it's the Comstock Act was kind of BS in terms of how it was used, they totally just used this, this law in, in a completely inaccurate way to, to punish her for voting as a woman. So she goes to trial and, um, the, the trial's crazy because, um, let's see, I'm kind of out of space here with this. We'll put it up here. She goes to trial and well, and there's actually, she does a couple of things. She's trying to petition and, and, um, uh, push for, for being released. They keep raising her bail. Um, she doesn't ultimately want to pay it. Uh, and then eventually, um, it does get paid. And she ends up getting upset about that because there was some rule with not being able to take it to the Supreme Court if your bail was paid. Um, so there, like I said, different rules and laws than today on some of that. But she goes to trial and the, the judge was uh, dismissive of her. Um, and you can see that in like the, the source um, that I had with that. Um, she also was uh, largely not allowed to speak. And at the very end, the judge basically instructed the jury to find her guilty. And then because of the bail um, money being paid, she couldn't take it to the Supreme Court. And the judge um, found her guilty, but, but, but the fine and, and like the things that they did were, were intentionally set up so she couldn't appeal the case with the bail um, and, and, and the, the, the guilty verdict, but um, setting it up so that if there was under a certain level, you couldn't, because the bail went to above a certain level, then she could have appealed it, but then it got paid. And the fine, I believe it was that it was under a certain level, like it was low. And if, and if you had your, your fine for, or, or if you went to jail. So she was not given jail time as her punishment for being guilty. She was given a fine and the judge intentionally gave this fine that was under the threshold for cost essentially to be able to appeal the case, essentially basically saying, well, like, look, you didn't go, there was no jail time and your fine was so low, there's no point in appealing this. And in, in most cases, that was the, the premise. But of course, for her, it, it was intentional to prevent her from being able to appeal the case 
um, further so that it would basically be dead in the water. That was the goal with this. But the, the judge really did basically say after the, the, the prosecutors presented the argument about uh, the 14th Amendment and how it didn't, uh, it didn't state that women were allowed to vote and if they, they clearly you know, mentioned men, so therefore if they didn't meant to include women and, and all of that. And, and so unfortunately, um, right, the, for her, um, well, she just, she was freed to go and she paid, it was a small fine, but like, the, unfortunately for her, like that was all it took to them. The judge basically said, okay, well, this is clear, clear evidence. So there's, there's, there's no need to, you know, have the jury decide, uh, they will just be directed to find her guilty. Um, and that, so yeah, kind of a corrupt system and, and, and structure with once again, women being blocked by, because they were kind of aggressively pushing for this. Now, um, the final attempt in this thing, now this, this is not going to end women's uh, push for rights. It is going to deflate them a bit and it's going to take a while for them to kind of get back up to kind of aggressive nature that they were really trying here because there really was this sentiment that um, if, if it was going to happen, it needed to happen while this change was taking place. And in some cases, you know, they were right because the reality is, right, that you have another revival and push of, of noticeable women's rights movement in the late 1800s. So it didn't, there was a small break, but it, didn't, it took till the 1920s with the 19th Amendment to get the right to vote. So it took a long time from when they were hoping here after, right after the civil war to get the right to vote, to actually get the right to vote. Um, so the, they finally, the, the, after another woman, uh, who her last name was minor was denied the right to vote. Um, she sued that, uh, uh person and that's Happerset. And so the, this eventually got taken all the way up to the Supreme court. And then the case was minor V Happerset. Um, and so what ends up happening is the Supreme Court makes a decision that is the worst outcome possible uh, and has significant consequences, not just for women, but actually for um, uh, basically the entire black population everywhere, but where it was most impacted was in the South. And so what they determined is, yes, minor was a citizen. So, I mean, I suppose yay for being recognized as a citizen, as a woman, but that voting was not a right, but a privilege bestowed by the federal and state governments to those deemed trustworthy to vote. So they, one of the arguments of the new departure, right, that we just talked about was that the, the belief that uh, as a citizen, you got the inherent right to vote as a citizen. And now the Supreme Court's coming about and saying, they had other arguments too. This was not the only thing, like if you, again, within one of the primary sources, read what the, the discussion and decision was. There was talk about just, well, they clearly didn't intend for women because they mentioned men. And if they went out of their way to mention men, and wanted women in the amendment, they would have mentioned women, or they wouldn't have mentioned men and left it generic to where it could be interpreted for everyone rather than just men. So there were sort of, there were other arguments that the Supreme Court made, but this is the most consequential one to say that while minor is a citizen, voting isn't a right of citizenship and instead is a privilege bestowed upon people who are deemed worthy enough to make a good vote. Basically like, yeah, sure, um, you're a citizen, but you know, we don't want everyone voting because there's lots of people who shouldn't be voting. And so it, it's really a, a privilege to be given the right to vote by the state, right? Or the, or the federal government, because those people are the ones that are entrusted with the fact that they will make a good vote. Um, it kind of goes back to even like the founding fathers idea that like, oh, we don't want the lower classes voting because they're uneducated and won't know how to vote properly. It's very similar vein. Why, why, what, what are the consequences then for this? Right? What, what are the consequences? So one of course is that it sets back women's, uh, rights and voting rights because now with the Supreme court denying that women had the right to vote 
um, you now have a much larger uphill battle to 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 get that. I mean, it also just kills the. It, we'll say ends the new departure uh, attempts, right? Because um, their whole argument gets shattered by the Supreme Court. So you do. It's why you do see this slowdown that that picks up later for pushing for women's right to vote again. But it but it makes it hard after this is. Um, does this decision is made for for people to for women to push for the right to vote and it kind of does completely stall it out for a while the other thing that was uh you know um maybe intended unintended consequence in the south is the south found themselves a new loophole which is that if it is bestowed it's a privilege bestowed on uh, bestowed for those deemed trustworthy to vote they now had the south had a new way to deny black voters and they used it um, in um, the they still had some rules they had to follow because the 15th amendment you couldn't deny just solely based on race or previous condition of servitude but they end up creating um, these these tests so what, what this creates with this are these, these voting tests that you had to take, and we'll look at those when we, when we talk about the segregated South, that, they, that you had to take in order to be approved to vote. And while within segregation with Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, the Supreme Court ruling was um, you could be separate, but it had to be equal, which of course then was not followed at all. They then said, okay, totally cool. We're giving everyone a voting test before they can vote. And they have to pass this test um, to prove that, that they are um, capable of doing so. The problem um, was, of course, that the, if they gave the voting test that they wanted to that made sure to exclude black voters, it also excluded a lot of poor white Southerners who are not very educated. And they didn't want to, uh, to exclude the uh, white Southerners from voting. So they created different uh, tests, if you will. They, they of course, claimed that it, it was random who got what. But there were very clearly, if a, a, black, a potential black voter came in to register and take the test, they gave them the super hard one. And they gave the white voters the ones that were super easy. And again, we'll look at it more specifically with the segregated South. Um, and and so the the questions were harder. And then they had like a a, a backup question. I feel was there to um, give a reason to deny the right to vote to black people, even if they passed the the harder test, which basically said, do you have uh, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And um, are you of morally good character, right? Well, because of the black codes, um, many black people had been charged with various crimes. And so you ended up successfully eliminating a lot of people from the illegal acts of the black codes. The other one, are you of good moral character, is somewhat subjective. And so if they passed everything else, and they hadn't been convicted of a crime ever, even during the Black Code period, um, then the uh, registers, to the, the people that registered people to vote, could just say, oh, yeah, they're not moral, a morally good character. And then you're denied the right to vote. And this ability to do this, though, came about because of the Supreme Court's decision to the new departure. So unfortunately... For women, this kind of clever idea of how to make the 14th and 15th Amendment work for them was denied, but not only denied for women, which set them back on being able to get the right to vote for many, many, many years. It ended up impacting um, mostly black men because black women were naturally already excluded because white women were also excluded from voting. So. Yes, it impacted black women, but mostly they were already excluded anyway, just as white women were. But it then was able to be used to target black men and later uh, black women who tried to, to vote. 
after, so what, unfortunately, like after the 19th Amendment, even though it said now that women could vote in the South, they still just kept using this test to deny black women the right to vote now, right? But until that happens, it's, mo it's mostly targeted towards men because women weren't even allowed to, to take the test. And so um, now, now because of this, um, you know, the South was a, during the segregated South period and Jim Crow laws were able to implement these to successfully make sure that the majority of, of the black population, male black population, would not be able to vote. Um, so yes, it's unfortunate. It, it was, a, it was a, a, a bad, the worst possible ending that could take place with this uh, push that seemed like a potentially smart and good idea ended up backfiring significantly and impacting not just women, but uh, uh, the black population in the South as well. All right, so that's, uh, so, and we'll pick back up with women in the progressive era, okay? So uh, in terms of this specific topic, right? Because as I mentioned, women don't give up on pushing for the right to vote and women's rights. It just kind of dies down. They're still doing stuff, but the massive awareness and aggressive pushing um, takes a little bit of a break I think from this hit and and then in the late 1800s you have a massive uptick of uh, a renewed vigor to push for women's rights so during the progressive era when we talk about that we will come back to looking at the uh, push for women's rights that eventually leads to the 1920s and the right for women to vote um, the other aspect, of course, that was going on then in the North as the South, we talked about, you know, with the failure of Reconstruction and moving towards segregation and Jim Crow laws in the North, uh, you were having a continued and massive shift in industrialization. It's sometimes called the second industrial, uh, industrialization, um, where you have major changes taking place um, and that, that not only uh, create uh, extremely poor um, and, and uh, poor, wor uh, lower class working conditions, poor communities, uh, and, and just general quality of life. But also at the same time, it creates a massive increase in wealth and these opulent, wealthy, rich uh, families that emerge out of this new industrialization. Um, and then you're also going to have a new middle class that we're going to talk about today that emerges from all of this as well. Um, and that's going to play a role for um, uh, many different things. So that's where we're shifting our focus to still in the north, but now not just on women's rights right after the after the Civil War and, and while Reconstruction's going on, but uh, the industrialization in the north itself. So what happens is that 90% of manufacturing took place in the cities. Um, it, it initially during the market revolution um, was outside of, of the cities. And that was due to a variety of reasons, technology um, and where they needed the factories to be powered, where they needed to be located near water sources, transportation. But now you have changes in technology that allows for um, uh, manufacturing to be done without having to have a, like a, a steam powered water source. You also have trains um, that, that go through almost all of the major cities, which allows for inland transportation rather than by waterways, which allows for the spread of goods. This creates a massive population boom in the cities. Um, so to give you an idea with this population boom, in the 1860s, uh, in, 18, in 1860 specifically, there was only 16 cities um, that had a population of 50,000 um, or more. Okay, so you had some, um, but 50,000, not, not that extra zero there, 50,000, no there is, <laughs> now there's too many, there we go, or more. Okay, but by uh, 1890, right, you had 12, uh, not, not 12 cities, you had one third of, of Americans who are city dwellers and 11 cities. One third of Americans had moved, 
to the city. So a huge chunk of the population now lived in cities and 11 cities had uh, a population of 250,000 people. Right, and, and many more after that that had populations of 50,000 or more. So that hopefully that shows you how massive of a transition uh, uh, to people living in the cities that took place. So what are the consequences of this? Well, one, because of manufacturing, because of the boom of cities, you have uh, increased immigration and it should say migration too because it both you had more immigrant labor coming in from outside the United States and more people inside the United States moving to the cities. Um, this right creates and the, and the population increase. So the combination of, of both of these things, what it ends up creating is, is mass overcrowding, right? Uh, not enough services. And we're going to talk about this more um, in um, the progressive era where they start like uh, addressing some of this. But what I mean by not enough services is that there was a lack of water, uh, sewage systems, and garbage systems for the populations. The, the reality is that these cities grew so quickly and by such a large number that the infrastructure of these cities could not keep up. And there's stories of, in the poorer areas, of course, not the wealthy areas, um, garbage that just piled up because there wasn't any service to take the garbage. So you just have piles and piles and piles of garbage. Um, many buildings didn't have water uh, um, to, it, to them because Again, uh, the, they could not keep up with that. They also had to, um, they converted a lot of large single family homes into uh, tenement style homes where you now um, had small little apartment buildings um, within like what used to be a, a one big huge home and made, they made new ones too. The problem with this of course is that especially for the ones that they converted, um, the lucky ones had windows. If you were in an inner apartment in this converted building, you had no windows in your apartment. There were no parks. There were not, there were not no parks. There were very few parks for people to get outside of, 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 you know, the city man-made buildings and small cramps, uh, tenement homes to have at least some fresh air and greenery and places to play. Um, they, they, there was also overcrowding because of this as well, which meant, of course, that uh, in like the poor uh, locations were um, pretty bad. Right, and um, the other thing that that was a problem with this was also food. Um, Prior to this, you know, most people still lived on farms before this, this mass kind of immigration and migration to the cities took place. Um, and so people were used to having, you know, decent quality food if you were in a smaller town or connected to farming um, because you were producing a lot of your own food and or selling, you know, the, this food, especially like meats to uh, the local areas and the, and the, to the, like the market, to the merchant in your local store. But right, that was what was being distributed to the local populations. Um, now you had less farmers. Um, you also weren't having as fresh of food. There's no great um, food storage system in place yet. And, and so they uh, like off meat was often sold to the lower classes because they couldn't afford the good stuff. There was uh, stories of bread that uh, had sawdust mixed in with it, one time plaster, um, and, and then other stories of them putting like these red flakes on the meat to make it look not, because you know, of course when meat starts to go bad, 
it loses that like reddish color of raw meat and kind of goes gray. And so in order to try to prevent that from being apparent, they would put these red flakes on it. And it turns out like the red flakes that they were putting on it were poisonous. Um, and, and there was no like FDA food regulation, nothing, right? There's so also like, and again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds with this because we're going to talk about this with the progressive era, but you, you have, uh, uh, we'll say not no again, cause it isn't none. It's a, a lack of government regulations that protect people. And this is not actually going to just be, um, for food, like, so right. Food living, but also businesses and factories and work and working conditions. There was nothing, right? None of those per labor protections, um, were present either. So the other thing that happens is a change in labor, um, with right. The, what I mentioned with this one here is the shift from farm to factory, um, which meant from the home to outside the home. And this is going to impact especially the, the new middle class that develops and specifically women in the new middle class, probably the most. But, you know, there's, it is a dreary kind of existence of going from the, like living on a farm, you know, you kind of set your own schedule. Yes, it's hard work, but you know, it, you don't have, uh, you're not dictated by the bell of the clock and not having harsh inhumane labor, uh, conditions. And now people were having to work 13 to 16 hours a day. Um, with very little breaks, uh, there was no protection against injury. You had managers that, you know, got on you constantly for tiny infractions and your life revolved around this kind of bell of the start of the day, uh, breaks can going back to work. And it's very jarring from what life used to be. Um, and, and uh, it really was made people weary to the bone. And, and this already existed, of course, at the end of the market revolution, but that's part of that transition that takes place. And then of course, as I mentioned, there was no labor regulations, business regulations. So why the, there was a huge uptick, not just in the middle class, but the extre extremely wealthy, there is a massive rise in wealthy, wealthy, wealthy families. Um, Andrew Carnegie, John Rockefeller are, are two of the, the best known examples of individuals who, and Carnegie, he comes up and was from an immigrant family, was poor when he was younger. He worked really hard um, and managed to build this massive business uh, within the steel industry. So he certainly, I think, is sometimes more sympathetic than like others, but, and so him, his family became ex massively filthy rich. Same with like I said, the Rockefellers and, and other families as well. Um, and, um, some of them actually, and even Andrew Carnegie for, for much of his life did not treat his workers very well. They were almost all anti-union, which protected workers' rights and help put down any strikes that had taken place, uh, in their, for their factories. Um, and, but the difference is Andrew Carnegie actually, um, uh, wrote this idea, um, that, uh, as wealthy people, they had a, uh, an obligation to help the rest of society. And the way to do that was not to, um, give money directly to the poor. He felt like that wouldn't help them, but instead create systems, uh, in place, um, to, that would help them. Right. And he donated, he also believed that like someone who is wealthy shouldn't die with, they should die with most of their wealth gone. And the reason that most of their wealth would be gone when they died is because they had donated and given it away to projects and causes that would um, benefit the lower classes. And then this, this was their obligation, but also a benefit to society overall. 
not not all of the wealthy families were like that. So so again, Andrew Carnegie kind of has a, a duality to him of, you know, things that were seen as pretty good and yet still treated his workers like crap. You know, he did know what it was like to be poor before becoming extremely wealthy. Not all of these these uh, individuals did. Um, but what this also creates is um, two things, more consumption, which means like buying stuff. And for the, for the wealthy that meant, show, the extremely wealthy that meant um, make, flaunting their wealth, uh, excessively flaunting their wealth. Um, for the middle class we'll talk about, it meant just being, trying to buy stuff to, to keep up with the Joneses, if you will. They, they, they knew they couldn't afford to buy the things that the wealthy were doing, but they wanted to try to emulate them as much as they could because this new middle class is going to have more wealth than they've ever had before, but not compared to the levels of these extremely wealthy families. Um, and then the, there was definitely a, a clear divide between wealthy and poor um, it was much more obvious than it used to be because the disparity was just so great. And what's crazy about it, when we talk about the mansions here in a minute, is that, well, there were certainly people who, who were farther removed, further removed from, from the poor areas in the cities. Many of these mansions that I'm going to kind of mention some examples of were in the cities. And you could walk just a few blocks and go from lavish, massive, massive mansions to the tenements and the poor areas in the city. Um, and yet the wealthy rarely ever ventured, ventured into any kind of poor area, quote unquote, if you will. Um, and so they kept themselves somewhat isolated, even though in physical location they were so close to the poverty um, and the hardships of industrialization, right? And, and, and so that dichotomy of, of how, how to mess with people walking by one minute seeing these opulent homes to the next minute being within these tenements. Um, and then new technology and buildings emerged, of course, because of that. We certainly owe, I mean, the, the industrialization, the second industrialization was not all bad things, right? Um, it did increase quality of life. Um, it also produced a ton of new technology that we today have technology that's backbone was from the technology created during the second industrial revolution. So, uh, you know, important in that sense. All right. So with this idea of, of, uh, conspicuous consumption, meaning blatant flaunting of wealth, um, one of the things that took place is, of course, the standard of living had increased. Um, and, and this is in part um, because, I mean, it's mostly because of, of the factories, right? These big businesses um, that emerged. Um, and um, in part, the standard of living would be just because of, uh, one, you have more wealthy super wealthy people because of factories and big business and the jobs that that now opened up and owners specifically. And then of course the new middle class, which we'll talk about in a minute. And those were, so the, what the new wealthy people were usually owners of factories and things like that. The new middle class were like the managers of the factories, the lawyers, the bankers and things like that. But the other thing with factories, of course, and why was there uh, a, a, the level a standard of living increase is that prices were cheaper, right? And more people had higher buying power, even the, the poor. So, um, this is sometimes confusing with this because the poor conditions were really bad and there were definitely people who were so close to like destitute, but the overall standard of living as a whole had significantly increased. And again, the reason being that, um, more people than ever were making more money than ever and prices for things drop significantly because of being made in factories now. 
And so more people could afford to buy things that in the past would have seemed like significant luxury items are now just common things that people of the middle class purchase, right? Or even the fact that there is a middle, this kind of new middle class to emerge is part of that increase of standard of living. Um, with this, um, and that's actually what I, you know, I was, I was kind of mentioning here. And one of the other reasons that the big businesses end up being so successful uh, and make so much money for the owners is because they're, um, one, there were new businesses that hadn't been there before and it was for goods that people really wanted. They were creating cheaper goods that people were just eating up to purchase. But there was no regulations on these owners. So they created monopolies um, to, to end up before regulations go into place. Many of these super wealthy, you know, had, had created uh, this kind of monopoly on their area. Um, and eventually that's going to be, uh, there's going to be a bunch of rules against that with reviews if you want to purchase a company of whether you already own too much of the market share of that type of business. So there's, there's a whole new set of regulations eventually that come in, but with, with no safety regulations, no regulations on how to treat your workers, um, no expectation of having unions, no regulations on uh, how the businesses were run, were run, almost all owners of these factories became massively wealthy. Uh, on the backs of the poor working class who didn't benefit nearly as much from these changes. The, uh, so, so what happens is these super wealthy families start deciding that they have to flaunt and show off their wealth. They would have, and I mean, here's an image that is from, this is an actual family from that time period that just even look at the room, the painting. So many of these houses would have elaborate art that was extremely expensive that should be in museums. But look at the way they dress, look at the things that are in this. This, this is a huge, uh, it just based in, in comparison to where the people are, look at how much space is in this room, right? For that time period to have such massive rooms in of itself is, is crazy. But then the fact that they're using the room to show off their wealth, not only in the clothing that they're wearing, um, but also the, the artwork um, that was displayed on it, but they would hold these massive parties at their mansions. Um, and also sometimes other places like the uh, Waldorf hotel, which was, became famously known for, uh, hosting and housing wealthy people, wealthy patrons. Um, you gotta have like a, a you could you, like, if you went in and you couldn't just like reach where these these events were taking place you had to have special access to it but i mean it's, it's pretty crazy and stuff like the parties that they had were just insane where they would have massive amounts of all different types of exotic foods um and super expensive stuff that they had flown in from europe um they um almost all the wealthy families had uh, many different pets and of course you know one of the popular pets that emerges is dogs this in itself isn't like, oh my gosh, dogs, especially because a lot of people have dogs today. But, but the reality is, is that while farms and working farms had dogs, you know, not everyone did in the city prior to this kind of increase in wealth where the dog was no longer a working dog. It was there, um, you know, as a pet, as a friend, um, which the wealthy hadn't, you know, considered before. But, but more of consequence with this, um, was like they also had other exotic animals like monkeys. Um, sometimes there were a few that had tigers and lions. Um, and again, this idea of, well, we're not just going to have a dog. We're going to go to the extreme and have these massive exotic animals to show off how wealthy we are in this process. The mansions, so this isn't, this is a, a modern picture of this, but this mansion is exactly this building is the size it, it was back in the Gilded Age, right? So it's huge. They built massive mansions that were that had like tons and tons of rooms um, that were built during this period to show intentionally to show off the level of wealth that these families had. 
because no, none of these families had an, enough people to justify like this living in this size of a house. Um, and, and it was, it really was meant to, to, to flaunt and show off their wealth, but they did other eccentric things. So, uh, Peter Palmer, uh, who, who was a businessman and wealthy, he intentionally, when he had his house built, uh, had no exterior doorknobs. And you're like, well, that seems weird. Well, why, why would they have that? Well, because that meant that you had to have a butler at all times to let people in. Right. If you didn't have a butler, you, you, your, your, as the owner of the house wouldn't be able to get in. And, and it, that was an, that was intentional. Like I'm so wealthy. I don't need doorknobs <laughs> because I have a butler on the other side that is always ready and waiting and multiple butlers in standby when he, you know, he goes on a break or vacation or bed, uh, that this butler can, you know, open the door for anyone who, is invited to the house. Um, Perry Smith had marble all over uh, his uh, house, along with actual Greek sculptures. That <laughs> Greek sculptures that should have been in museums that would have been insanely expensive to procure. Ebony and gold was also all over uh, the house. They had a butler's pantry that had faucets for hot and cold water, which again, that doesn't sound today like something fancy to us but was a huge freaking deal um, to be able to have access to back then. Um, so again, the mansions were seen and they, and like they would have again, like basically rooms that was like a whole massive library and another room that was basically its own art museum. And, and it was intentional to, because it was, it was meant to flaunt off their wealth. So when they invited people over to their homes, they could showcase their wealth through the, you know, thousands and thousands of books that they had, which at the time books were still pretty expensive, especially certain types of books. Um, and, and the average lower class person didn't have access to many books. And yet here they are having, uh, uh, in their house, you know, a massive library that was just, you know, ridiculously large, um, that they would have, um, you know, all of this artwork, not just one piece, but like tons of artwork that was just also ridiculous amounts of artwork or, or just the fact that I'm going to put gold in everything, right? Some of it was gaudy. Some of it looked like really nice. Definitely. Some people went overboard to the point that it became gaudy because they were trying to show off their wealth. Uh, so yeah, excessive rooms, crazy decorations, crazy concepts of no doorknobs, all to showcase off and highlight how extremely wealthy they were. Now, one of the benefits or things that they did is they, that the wealthy were, uh, patrons of, um, several areas that, that, that eventually open up the option for, for other people, the opera, uh, theater, libraries and art galleries. And while initially this is going to be only for, uh, the wealthy, right? Basically what they did is they had, they initially created their own private ones and they would just share it amongst other wealthy people. It also in the progressive area, we're going to look at how this eventually expands to access for all. Um, and even some of the wealthy individuals started pressing for and became pre uh, patrons, not just within, uh, the wealthy community, but became patrons of libraries and opera and theater that they wanted to be available to the lower classes as well. So if you're, if you're looking at like one of the benefits of wealth that emerges from this, you could, uh, you know, push towards that. All right. One of the other changes besides the extremely wealthy with their kind of crazy mansions and lifestyle was the new middle class that emerges around the same time. So why did the new middle class develop? Because as I mentioned with the factories, right, there were these new jobs that emerged, um, that made people decently well off, but were not wealthy 
um, like the extreme wealth of these that we talked about um, before. These tended to be bankers, lawyers, like factory managers, and other kind of jobs like this. And these people, um, and, and, and certain skilled labor, but these, these people were, were, were those that, like I said, they, they, they became well off, but not anywhere close to the extreme wealth of factory owners, right? Biz, big business owners. And, and right, big business didn't exist before this period. You had businesses, but, but not like these massive businesses. Like we have corporations and huge businesses today, and that's just the norm. But that didn't exist before this period, all right? The, 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 the rise of those things that eventually become corporations start from this period. So the middle class is now a well-off group that is definitely, you know, significantly above the lower classes and the poor, but is nowhere near the wealthy, wealthy families of these factory owners and big business owners by, by any means. Um, the other reason that you, the new middle class is kind of solidified is, as I mentioned, the lower prices and quality of life increased overall because now more people than ever had more money than they've ever had before. And because of factories, prices for goods decreased enough that a, like a lot of people now could purchase things that they would have never considered before. And for the middle class, they wanted to emulate the wealthy. They wanted to be like them. The problem was they could not afford to be like them, but they created their own measure of that. And one of the things, there was a couple of things. One is that, that the wives did not work, right? If you wanted to show you were above the working class, make sure your wife, so instead she stayed at home, right? If you, if you could afford to have your wife not work, that showed that you were not you know, part of the working class, lower class people, that you had enough money to support the family without your wife having to work. Another aspect was, you know, buying things for the home. And we could say person, right? But so like um, women wanted the latest fashions that they saw the wealthy were purchasing. You didn't used to decorate your home. Uh, this is also common, right? We have so much junk in our houses now, even, you know, that because you, we buy stuff and we collect stuff because we have some money to do that. Even people that are, you know, struggling a little bit often still can buy some additional things. And then of course there are people who can't, but more people than not have the ability to, to buy, um, you know, things they don't need just things they want, which is good. I mean, it makes your quality of life better a lot of the time. If you have, you know, items and things that, that improve your life, even if you don't necessarily need them for survival, right? In the past, you know, people didn't have a lot of a spare spending money. So you didn't go out and purchase a bunch of extra things you didn't really need. You bought what you needed because you didn't have spare money to do so. Now the middle class has spare money. And they want to they wanna showcase that as much as they can, like the wealthy, even if they can't. So what it leads to then is the development of department stores where the middle class, specifically women, because they were staying at home while their husbands went off to work, could go buy things for the home that they hadn't previously done. And in fact, would often, you know, these, these department stores were, some of the early ones were so huge they're kind of the predecessors to the shopping mall. Um, and women would go there and spend half a day in these department stores. They started creating restrooms and lounge areas to rest because they were there so long. Um, this is the advertising here is Sears, Roebuck and Co. Eventually just becomes Sears, right? Until I guess Sears shuts down too. But um, Sears, Roebuck and Co. was one of the first massive department stores and it was, they were huge. Um, they also created their own catalog for mail order, uh, shopping. So people would get these catalogs that had all the things that Sears, Roebuck and Co sold, which was basically think that they are like the Walmart of today. They had a little bit of everything you could think of. Um, right. It wasn't just clothes. It wasn't just furniture. It, if you, you know, 
could kind of think about what was available back then, you probably could purchase it at Sears. Now, it wasn't the imported type that the wealthy got, but you could buy replicas. Like, so women would buy dresses that looked like the fancy ones from Paris that the wealthy were wearing. People were adding pianos to their home because they wanted to, to emulate that, that and, and they could afford it. People bought other decorations and things in their home to make it look like they were, you know, well off because they could have all these things. Essentially, stuff became part of that symbol of power um, that, that didn't exist before. This not only led to the, the mail order catalogs that literally got shipped to your home and then you could order it and send it off and then they would deliver your goods, right? So this whole, like, inter it's pre-internet shopping style. And in fact, mail order catalogs continued into, you know, the, the 1980s and early 1990s until the internet kind of replaced that. So, I mean, you could probably, uh, there's, there's some mail order catalogs in the 2000s. So that, that process started here. Um, advertising was also something that changed. And there wasn't a huge advertising market before the, all of this because people just bought what they needed. But now that, that the new middle class had money to spend and they wanted to spend it, companies started advertising to get people to, you know, buy the, what they wanted, not what they needed. But also sometimes to see what they wanted is, is to convince them that they needed it. And I mean, it's clever psychology in that way. But example of this is ivory soap um, uh, was working on an experiment with uh, their mixture for their soap. And they were wanting to do something different. And I don't know exactly what it was that they originally wanted to do. But instead, what they accidentally did was make their bar of soap, which women used for, for washing laundry with a, a, a washboard. It was very tedious work. And you had, you'd have these big, huge um, uh, barrels with hot water and, and water for rinsing. And, it, and again, it took like all day and stuff like that. But what they did is it, the, the mixture that they made, instead of doing what they had want or planned originally, they uh, accidentally created soap that would float. Now, this doesn't sound like a huge deal. Uh, kind of like, okay, the, the soap floats. <laughs> but if you think about, if you're having to do laundry and every time you, you put down the soap, it sinks to the bottom of this massive water barrel, then you've got to reach your hand in and search around for it, getting you wet. The, the convenience of a bar of soap floating on the water is all it was, right? The, the, the bar of soap was the same cleaning ability uh, that floats, was the same cleaning ability as a bar of soap by Ivory that didn't float. And they still kept selling those as well. Um, they just had to be cheaper than, than what it used to be. And so that's a huge deal to, to, to be able to be like, well, look, I don't have to stick my hand in uh, this massive tub anymore because I can afford to buy this soap, even though, again, it, it does the same thing. And, um, and so people wanted to buy it, right? They didn't need it, but they wanted to buy it. And so they start creating advertisements to convince you of how much better this soap is. And of course, they charged more for it, too. Um, so with this, um, the cult of domesticity emerges and um, it comes because um, the traditional roles of men and women change with the new middle class. Again, this is just the middle class and women's status declines significantly. So traditional roles were farming, right? Where men stayed at home to farm right? And the, the uh, women helped and labor was visible. After industrialization, men left the home to work and women stayed at home again for the middle class. So women's work at home raising the kids was invisible. Now, your value in society, and this is for any society, any time period, um, in, influences your status in that society, 
right? Well, the value now used to be production in farming and women were active producers within the household and their husbands saw it. But now the value, because it's, uh, industrialization has switched to wage labor, is money. And men going outside of the home were the ones that produced that value. And then when you tie it with that now women's work was invisible, women's status went way down in the middle class. They, uh, their labor wasn't being viewed and it, it's even to this day, it's still easy for people who like are stay at home, uh, parents for the other person who works to get home and feel like they really didn't do much that day, even though they did so many things because their labor is invisible. They're not seeing them. They're not seeing what they're doing throughout the day and all the craziness of raising the kids, making the meals, cleaning up and, and, and then so you tend to there's some lost value in that. So women created the cult of domesticity to try to target this problem. And so what they called it is it was a noble profession. The cult of domesticity was a noble profession and they intentionally used this wording noble and profession, right? They wanted people to see what they were doing while staying at home as a, a, a calling that was worthy, right? That there was value in the labor that they were doing. Cause you could, there's a difference if you say, oh, this is just my job versus this is my calling, right? Or this is my profession, right? A noble profession, right? The language was intentional. Then the next component was true motherhood, right? These are, these are the components of, of the cult of domesticity for women to follow. And again, it was an attempt to raise their status. And so, they said, you know, women's, you know, one of the kind of indicators of true womanhood in their role was to be mothers, to raise children, right? So you, people will recognize that when they're staying at home raising their kids, they're fulfilling this kind of true womanhood ideal. Um, and then home as a haven was the idea that because of the change in industrialization, the outside world had become this big, scary place where individualization was glorified and people only looked out for themselves. There was corruption, there was poverty, there was drunkenness, there was, you know, backstabbing. And so the whole idea was that women in the home were supposed to create this uh, protection from the outside world. The home uh, the, the whole saying, the home is the haven in the heart, heartless world comes from this time period. But the idea that they would create this little bubble in the home where when the husband came home and the, for the children too, they were protected from the evils of the outside world. Um, economic manager, because women were, middle-class women were largely the ones buying things for the home, right? They're the ones that had the time during the day to go purchase things for the family. They were now also the primary buyers of the household and therefore, right, they were responsible for managing the money. Um, the, this period with industrialization was pretty, um, volatile. You had lots of panics. There were so many panics during this period where the market would crash and then it would go back up and then the market would crash. And so this idea of, of economic instability um, was um, something women were supposed to combat by um, not only just how they bought stuff, but that they were to manage the money to ensure that the home was economically secure. And then moral center was the idea that because this is a heartless and individualistic world, women were supposed to help maintain the proper morals and values to protect against um, the outside world's corruption. So, so again, these components are what makes up the cult of domesticity and it was done intentionally and created intentionally by middle-class women in a hope to have this invisible labor that had less value because money was the value, um, showcase and emphasize that what they were doing was important and what they were doing has value. And if that could be communicated, then you know ideally their status would go back up some within society. This, this list here is definitely like largely domestic sphere based, right? It's all about the home. 
And there is some criticism towards this as all this did is reinforce that women's role and place was in the home. But one of the things it does is that there are changes for women's roles over time, that, especially that we see starting in the progressive era, um, because of the cult of domesticity. So one was with motherhood, right? Of course, the question came up, well, women's true role, true mother, true womanhood is to be a mother. But what if you don't have children yet? Or what if your children are already grown? Then are you just no longer part of that true womanhood? Um, what, what happens is basically the thing that comes from this. And I mean, and there was even a saying, home first, community, and then the world. The idea that women were supposed to serve everyone uh, else but themselves. And of course, the home was the first priority. But then if you, you know, didn't have people and the children in the home, then, then you were just supposed to help to serve your community. And then if you had been doing that, then the world somehow. Um, and so what naturally kind of develops from that is this idea of social work. Women started, uh, middle-class women started um, giving to the poor. Again, many, uh, even the middle class, live pretty close to um, the tenements and the, and the lower classes. And so they felt like here is, you know, this obligation of if I'm not a mother, my, that role in the cult of domesticity can be filled through helping others in need, right? Those who can't take care of themselves. It's a little, it's paternalistic, but it's the idea of like, okay, so women started giving out food baskets and clothing to the poor. This morphs to official social work where women actually got college degrees in social work. And this we see, we're going to, we will come back and visit where we'll see the consequence of this within the progressive era and with settlement houses, which is like a, a, a bigger blown up version of just taking care of the poor. So that, that eventually allows women to do stuff outside of the home. There was also increased political involvement. Women started pushing at, through the cult of domesticity for voting rights. And then another was the temperance movement. Women saw the drinking, right, and the problem with drinking that some people had as a destruction of the home. And they made the argument that, um, like, hey, at, with the cult of domesticity, we're supposed to make these changes, and or not changes, but protect the home. We can't do that if we don't have any voting power. And they, 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 they showed that example with, like, the issues with drinking, and they wanted to change the laws. And I guess that they fulfilled that when women... Uh, uh, successfully basically helped vote for and push in the temperance movement where it uh, blocked like drinking alcohol became illegal. Um, but they, they used the cult of domesticity to get people on their side for women's right to vote. It was very clever. Essentially it's the idea of like you want us to protect the home as a haven. You want us to create this, this protective bu um, bubble but we can't do that if we can't vote for certain policy changes. But don't worry, we're only going to vote for women's issues, right? And that was what they, they used. And people were like, oh, that makes sense that you maybe need to vote for women's issues because to fulfill your role within the cult of domesticity. So, okay. And then, of course, that didn't, you know, then the realization that there aren't just women's issues and women are going to vote for more than women's issues. But it was a clever way to try to get people, men specifically, to get behind women's right to vote and, and actually even not just men there were definitely women who had been anti-voting before that when they put it within the terms of the cult of domesticity were like cool then um, women in working right this was connected to the economic manager um, the idea that you know women were supposed to manage the finances of the home and keep them stable but some women, you know, the, the thing was like, well, I, I can only do what I can do with the money being brought in by my husband. How do I keep it stable if it's not enough? And while middle class women weren't supposed to work outside the home, one area of work that emerged that was, became very popular and acceptable was uh, writing authors. Those many women started writing books and magazine articles. Um, and in fact, the romance genre took off 
during this period because of all of the influx of, of, of female authors at this time. But they wrote other articles about like the frugal housewife, um, which was like, you know, how to, to manage a household while, you know, managing a budget, that type of thing. Um, and then lastly, revivals. During this time, you have the Second Great Awakening, which is where you had uh, traveling preachers go around and speak out in open fields to large groups, and they were usually pretty charismatic. And because women's job was, this was connected to the, the moral center, right? Their job is the moral center. Many women were drawn to these traveling preachers and, and followed them around to the different places they traveled to preach and actively helped uh, promote uh, these, these preachers, right? Because they could bring back these ideas and get involved in this religious reform um, that they hoped would, you know, help against the kind of evils of this new society that only, where people only looked out for themselves. So all of these things within the cult of domesticity, while they started out within the domestic realm, did ultimately expand to new areas. It just took some time. And again, as a reinforcement, the cult of domesticity was created by middle class women in an attempt to make their invisible labor visible and show the value in that um, so that their status could, could increase. Um, all right, so that's where we're going to stop for today, and then we'll pick up in the next lecture looking more at the Gilded Age and what was taking place.